two members of our crew working in Akiva. What they're doing now is isolating and shaping a stratigraphic column uh, prior to removal. Uh, the next step after shaping it will be to wrap it in plaster of Paris so we can take it out in one bulk, just like the one you see on the bench there. Originally we had a, a complete column, but because of weight factors we cut it in half. Uh, the purpose here is to take these columns intact back to the laboratory, uh, separate them, subject them to flotation and pollen analysis so we can get an idea of plant succession on the site and the uh, nature of botanical remains after the abandonment of the kiva. Try to get all the air in the in the cloth. Okay, on this side. I was asking Bill if we could possibly get our post, uh, our prehistoric as well as historic uh, environment out of this column. To try to recreate the past and the present in an environmental manner. And Bill was explaining to me that possibly in certain cases we can. Uh, you can say. Well, like most of the dirt in the column is uh, post-occupation stuff that's come in since uh, the abandonment. And it's going to contain a lot of information about what's happened at this locality in the last seven or eight hundred years. Uh, is, you know, Bill came in here all that time, you know, and accumulated. That's kind of what we're getting here. Uh, charcoal from a burned roof. And right uh, under this, we know that there's a layer. Well, it wasn't the primary floor. And then this is fill here from down here at the bottom where we have a definite floor up to here is all filled during the occupation. And that's where we'll get a lot of information about the vermin at the time of the occupation. We from this layer, this part in here. This surface is a little obscure. The largest, most obvious structure on this site is a pit house, which we believe to be now to Pueblo One. This is the floor. We've uncovered about a third of the house. The floor itself is only one of the important things that we've noted in this site. In this wall here, we've been able to pick up the collapse of the roof, an area of a period of abandonment indicated by thinly bedded water washed sediments. Then a second short occupation with a deposition of trash indicating the Pueblo I period again. Another minor period of abandonment, again, the sands. 
and then a second occupation, again Pueblo 1, period of abandonment, this time an occupation during Pueblo 2 times, final abandonment with a very minor use indicated by a fire hearth here. The upper fill here is probably modern with disturbance by amateur excavations. From the floor of the pit house, we find above it the roof fall. The area was then abandoned as indicated by these thinly bedded sterile water washed sands. There was a short reoccupation indicated by a dark band here, another period of abandonment, then an occupation where there was a buildup of cultural fill from the Pueblo I period. We had another period of abandonment, again the sterile sand, another trash layer, this time Pueblo II. Cave was again abandoned, occupied for a very short time, small fire hearth present in the wall here. Then final abandonment by the Anasazi and the modern deposits among the material disturbed by looters, previous excavators of the site. We know that the people that lived in this cave were farmers from the corn, beans, bits of squash that we found in the deposits here. They probably farmed the deep alluvial soils of the river bottom, depending on the river, to fertilize their crops and to provide the necessary moisture. But these people also depended upon the wild crops about them. We know that here they hunted deer, elk, large game, were a fairly large part of their diet. These hunters would also provide the necessary reconnaissance, sending people far and wide to see how the crops were coming, the wild grass seeds. In addition to farming, we know these people were hunters. Deer and elk formed a major part of their diet. And these hunters, as well as hunting, bringing meat into the camp, were the contacts to watch the plants grow, watch the wild seeds, the pinion, wild grass, juniper, service berry, cactus, all the things that these people were able to utilize throughout the different parts of the year as supplements to their agricultural food resources. unique feature of this site that shows us just how important the uplands were are these steps which lead up and provide access to the shrubbery, the uh, communi vegetational community of the slope up above. We know from dried materials found within the shelter that the Anasazi that occupied the cave utilized the cactus, among other plants. They utilized the pads, burning the spines off, roasting them. As well, the fruit of the cactus was used Stop. The fruit could be eaten as it was picked, of course, after removal of the spines or they could be taken back to the cave and dried, acting as a self-contained package for the many cactus seed within the fruit itself, which themselves could be ground into a flour or a gruel. In addition to food, the Dolores River and the slopes of its canyons provided most of the other raw materials utilized by the Anasazi. For instance, information in the cave indicates that yucca was a primary source of fiber from which were made sandals, mattings of all sorts, cordage, 
snares, ropes. The leaves of this plant could be pounded, producing the long fibers, which could then easily be woven to provide the necessary materials. Another possible use of the yucca to the Anasazi, suggested by the early Hopi practices, is that the root be extracted and a soap made. tuberous root could be dug out of the ground, pounded between two rocks, and the fibrous parts of the tissue releases a natural detergent. As well as the plants, we know that the Anasazi depended on these slopes to provide many other materials sandstone slabs such as these were used for building stone drawn from the more thinly bedded portions of the formation. Cherts eroded from uh, up above washed down in the slope were used to make tools axes, knives, points for arrows the tools for farming and hunting. The Anasazi took a lot from this environment. They utilized it, were changed by it. And as we begin our research here, trying to understand how the interaction progressed, how the Anasazi met change with the changing climate, then perhaps we'll start to understand a little bit about why this area was abandoned by them ultimately and in that gain a few insights into how we ourselves should utilize this land